This is Hannah. This is Bailey. This is Butter. Welcome to the Motocross Park. <laughs> I don't care. I like that one. Tony Blazer back with another video here for the Motocross Vault Reviews on YouTube. And for this one, what I'm going to do is take a look back at Yamaha's uh, motocross ads and brochures over the uh, 1970s. Uh, I'll probably do a series of these covering the 70s, 80s, uh, 90s, and 2000s. Um, because I don't want it to be too long, I'm going to break them up by decade, though. So this first one's just going to cover the 1970s. Um, today, brochures and ads are almost like a, <clears throat> you know, like a lost art. Uh, the advent of the Internet has really kind of uh, almost destroyed that. I love, as you can see, I have these great magazines and brochures. I have uh, hundreds of them. And uh, I love that stuff when I, I started collecting them as a kid. I love looking back at them. I use them for these reviews and stuff now. And uh, it kind of sucks that uh, things like YouTube and the Internet, which obviously this is great for some of this stuff, but on the other hand, it's kind of uh, basically taken the manufacturers away from really doing much in the way of print ads or uh, even physical brochures anymore. You're lucky if you can find a PDF online. Uh, it really isn't uh, isn't common anymore, which kind of sucks because, like I said, it's great historically to go back. And unfortunately, you know, the internet is not uh, the internet is not eternal. As soon as somebody pulls something down, you can't get it anymore. Or maybe they didn't upload it in the first place. It's hard to find. That's why I've gone through and uploaded so much of these classic uh, magazines and stuff uh, online so people can enjoy them. So in any case, uh, I'm going to go, like I said, through this a little bit at a time, starting with the early days of Yamaha's motocross stuff, and then up through the end of the '70s. And if you like this sort of stuff, make sure you subscribe to the channel, uh, share it on social media. That's very helpful. This new channel is, uh, like I said, just going to be about reviews, old magazines, old bikes, things like that. Uh, so if you do like this thing, make sure you share it and uh, hopefully help, help uh, grow the channel. And I hope you enjoy it. Here's the 1970s uh, in Yamaha and their ads. As we get into the early days of Yamaha, one thing to keep in mind is the fact that uh, none of the Japanese manufacturers were really big into motocross in 1970. Uh, really, the only manufacturer that was uh, serious about it was Suzuki, and even they didn't really have a production model uh, for motocross use. They were riding their works bikes in Europe and actually being very successful on the GPs, but uh, at the production level, there wasn't much presence, really. The uh, TM was still a year away, and even when they came out, they weren't the best motorcycles. Uh, basically, as far as the Japanese were concerned, if you're going to race motocross, you're going to probably uh, race a converted enduro bike, which would be what you would call these days a dual sport. Uh, enduro bikes were pretty much the jack-of-all-trades of, all trades of uh, the early 70s, late 60s uh, off-road community. Uh, in the terms of Honda, they would be a four-stroke based on like a, a, you know, a small uh, single or twin. In the case of a manufacturer like Yamaha here, that would be a two-stroke based on one of their uh, enduro machines. Uh, the DT1, which was the 250, uh, the AT1, which is a 125, or the RT1, uh, which was a 360, which was their open-class bike. Uh, Yamaha at the time sold a kit called a GYT kit, which would upgrade the standard uh, DT1 enduro or one of its uh, larger or smaller siblings into a motocross bike. It uh, had some performance upgrades uh, to the motor, carburetor, uh, basically up the performance a little bit over the standard issue enduro machine and uh, then you would strip off the lights strip off some of the other uh, accoutrement there that would be appropriate for street use turn signals and what have you and you have a motocross bike uh, if you think about that today it's pretty crazy to think you'd take a, a bike like a, a crf uh, 250 um, dual sport and motocross it but at the time like i said that was kind of the common a uh, common thing people did. They were taking bikes never really built for motocross in the first place and kind of trying to race them. Uh, if you wanted a purpose-built motocross bike, you're going to have to go to Europe for that, something like a Husqvarna or a CZ or Mako or something of that ilk. Uh, as far as the Japanese were going, these were much less expensive, of course, but their performance potential was less. Uh, Yamaha, uh, like Honda, Suzuki, um, Kawasaki, they really were looking more the the do-it-all, jack-of-all-trades motorcycle. They hadn't really started to specialize in motocross at this point. For 1971, uh, Yamaha was back with basically the same lineup they'd had in 1970. Uh, their off-road offerings continued to be focused mainly on just enduro bikes, which, like I said, were essentially a modern dual sport. Uh, all of them had turn signals, headlights, speedometers. Uh, if you wanted to take it off-road, whether you wanted to do woods racing or motocross, you're going to want to strip that stuff off. In the case of the motocrosser, you're going to want to add a little power, take all that junk off. Uh, suspension, even on these, uh, the 
quote unquote motocross models uh, wasn't great. It was enduro bike suspension, which, as you can imagine, a street bike is not going to have phenomenal suspension <laughs> for motocross use. Uh, but of course, people's expectations are pretty low. Um, these all three, the DT1 MX250, the 125, and the 360 had the GYT kit installed. They still had auto lube injection, which was Yamaha's uh, uh, self-oiling system, which you ever had like a blaster or an early two-stroke enduro bike you're pretty familiar with. Um, like I said, these are not serious motocross machines by any means. Uh, kind of an afterthought, really. If you did want to race them, you could. Uh, if you were going to go uh, a more serious route, you're going to probably want to get something from Europe. Uh, but they did offer them at least. Like I said, this is early, early stuff here as far as Yamaha goes. I'm sure they sold a bazillion of them in in spite of the fact that uh, they probably weren't the highest performance machines at the time. They were inexpensive and reliable, and uh, that's worth a lot if you're just trying to get into the sport. For 1972, Yamaha was back with a pretty significant uh, technological advance in two-stroke design. Uh, one of the problems with early two-strokes were uh, they lacked the low-end torque of a four-stroke. Uh, early two-strokes used what they call a piston port design, which was... Uh, basically an open intake port right into the um, cylinder. There was no reed valve. But for 1972 here, Yamaha added a reed valve for the first time. Uh, they gave their version of the reed valve a uh, kind of a catchy name called torque induction. Now, I don't want to get too into the weeds here in uh, going over basic two-stroke design, as probably most of the people watching this channel have a pretty fairly decent understanding of it. But uh, in simplified terms, a two-stroke obviously is just like any motor. It's an uh, air pump. It's uh, sucking air and fuel in and expelling spent gas once that is lit. A two-stroke works by having ports in the side, which are openings in the side of the cylinder. When the piston goes on the upstroke, it sucks fuel into the bottom end of the engine. When that piston comes back down, it forces that uh, fuel charge through another set of transfer ports in the side of the cylinder up into the top into the combustion chamber. Now what happens is in a piston port motor, like the one here on the left, uh, there is no uh, obstruction obstruction uh, to the intake, meaning that when that piston uh, is on the stroke, some of that uh, fuel charge can leak back into the intake. It can go back towards the carburetor, uh, what they used to call blowback. Now, what a, a reed valve does is it's a one-way check valve, meaning that uh, when it's sucking fuel in, it lets fuel into the uh, bottom end of the two-stroke uh, motor, and when the uh, piston goes on its stroke, that reed valve closes off, meaning it's a one-way valve. It won't let that blowback back in. So you're not getting any of that uh, unspent fuel bleeding back into the intake charge. Anything that you lose there on, in terms of unspent fuel, that's less energy potential, less, uh, less force when that uh, spark fires. So at low RPMs, because the speed of the piston is not as great, there's more chance for that uh, blowback to happen. Uh, that tends to be a lot of the reason, like a two-stroke, for instance, has that distinct power band. Uh, these old ones had a very kind of a light switch power band. Uh, there's a, you know, it's always a compromise as to where you put those ports uh, for high performance, where you still don't get some, uh, you know, some of that blowback into the engine. So when they went to a reed valve, that allowed the motor to be more efficient at low RPMs. You didn't get any of that blowback gave the motor more torque and much better response. So for 1972 here, Yamaha added their version of a reed valve, and they called it torque induction. Now, uh, like I said, Honda, when they came out with the CR and stuff, they had piston ports. Most two-strokes at the time had piston ports. This was a pretty pretty innovative uh, and important design in, in uh, two-stroke advancement. I mean, you, you figure today, every two-stroke you see still uses a reed valve. It's a really great system that uh, uh, you know, stood the test of time. And this is the first year where Yamaha put it into production. In addition to the motor, Yamaha updated the bodywork, chassis, and suspension for 1972. Now, this DT2 MX is the first official motocross, in quotes, model from Yamaha. Like I said, the earlier versions were just kitted enduro bikes, but this came from the factory just like this. Uh, no lights, no turn signals to take off, none of that stuff. It was designed, first and foremost, to be a motocrosser. Now, again, it's probably 15 to 20 pounds heavier than, like, a really great bike from Japan, I mean, from uh, Europe. It was probably more of a, again, kind of a jack at all, a jack of all trades. You could ride, you know, some cross country, a little enduro, some motocross on it. Uh, if you were going to actually be at the top level of motocross, it would need significant um, upgrades. Uh, Gary Jones did win a national title on it uh, on a bike based off this machine, but it was 
more or less every part was changed. It really wasn't much of a serious motocrosser. But this, if you're thinking uh, in terms of motocross history, this really is the first model that Yamaha made that can be considered a motocross bike first and foremost. Uh, there was a 250 version here, and they also made the 360 still, which was the open class version, uh, the RT2MX. Again, uh, designed for motocross first and foremost, but uh, you know, not really um, a top flight motocrosser by any means. For 1973, Yamaha leaned into this motocross thing uh, by adding a few more models and also renaming uh, the main motocross models within their lineup. Uh, instead of the RT360, there was a new MX360, uh, clearly for motocross. Uh, the MX360 did have uh, some improvements over the RT. It added a new thermal phase rear shocks, an omni-phase balancing which I guess is a countershaft balancer. I'm not sure what omniphase refers to, but anyway. It still had the torque induction. Uh, there was a new frame, uh, new ignition, pretty significant updates for 1973. Um, in addition to that, they had an all-new 500 model, the SC500. Now, this motor is, uh, motorcycle is infamous for being one of the absolute worst motorcycles Yamaha ever produced. Uh, the thing handled terribly. Uh, it was notorious for seizing, had a light switch power band. It was a total pile of garbage. Um, if uh, if you ever look up like 10 worst motorcycles in all time, uh, the old SC500 is right up there with the old Cyclone. Definitely a giant turd of a motorcycle uh, <laughs> in this year, 1973. In addition to the big boards, Yamaha had made some pretty significant changes to the uh, other machines in its lineup for 1973. The new GT MX80 got a 20cc bump and displacement over the old mini class offering from Yamaha and the AT MX125 interesting that they kept the AT name there they kind of half step in it here uh, received an all-new frame uh, more comfortable seat lighter tank quicker release gas cap woohoo and of course the torque induction as well uh, this was Yamaha's 125 offering in 1973 today 100 cc two strokes are mostly kind of big wheeled uh, 80s uh, but in 1973, uh, Yamaha did have a 100, the LT MX100, which was more of a mid-sized bike, really not much smaller than a 125. Uh, 100cc racing was pretty big in the 70s. Um, I'm not really sure why. I, like I said, I was born in 69, so I wasn't uh, really into it at this point. But uh, there was RM100s later and uh, YZ. A lot of the uh, kind of in-between size bikes um, were popular for a while. Now for uh, 1973... This bike as well got some updates. Um, a built-in silencer. I don't know what kind of silencer it had before. Maybe that means it's stuck to the end of the pipe. I, I have no idea. A five-speed gearbox and a new lighter weight frame. Uh, the, like I said, I, I've actually never ridden one of these. I have no idea whether it was any good or not. But uh, it was available for those people, I guess, who are a little too small for a 125 but too big for an 80. Last up in this ad for 1973, we have the MX250. And Yamaha bragging about winning the 1972 Inner AMA International Motocross Series, uh, what we think of today as the uh, really the first national championship. Now, Yamaha does brag again about an American winning, um, but to be honest, I think if I remember right, they excluded any Europeans from this these standings. So, yes, Gary Jones won, but it kind of has a little bit of an asterisk there. Uh, like I said earlier, the uh, this bike here did not have really anything in common with the one Gary Jones rode, but they did make some improvements for 1973. Uh, a lot of little stuff. They improved the front forks slightly. Again, these are more or less enduro forks and enduro su suspension on these things. So they were getting better a little bit at a time, but still pretty grim by any standard, I would think. Uh, the frame was new. Uh, it made some changes to affect the handling. Overall, was small minor changes for 1973. Uh, better things were on the horizon for Yamaha fans. For 1974, Yamaha basically added some minor refinements to their MX line. Uh, it still had quite a uh, number of machines in it with their awesome thermal phase rear shocks, which I don't know what thermal phase means, but it sounds cool. Um, but one interesting thing about the MX line for 1974 is this is the first year that they went to the classic yellow and black bumblebee color. Um, I'm not sure if international models were yellow, like if, if you went to, got a Canadian MX one here, if it would have been white and red. I'm not sure. I've actually never seen any of those. But in 1974 here, you can see this is the first year for that iconic look with the kind of uh, strobe on the tank and the yellow and black color scheme. Love this color scheme. Now, uh, while the MX models were only subtly changed, there was big news at the top of the line here. 
with the all-new YZ125 and YZ250. Now, this is the first year for these models. Uh, the YZ250A here is a direct replica of the works bikes they were running at the time. It was super light, uh, about 60% more expensive than a Honda CR or a comparable machine. Very expensive, very light, very trick machine uh, for its time. The thing was wicked fast, uh, but very limited production. There were very few of them made. And if you weren't like an expert, you probably weren't going to be happy with it anyway. You would have been happy with a standard MX. It was a, a bike made for pros, uh, not not the current YZ that you think of now, where it's obviously made for Joe Schmo all the way up to Jeremy McGrath to ride it. Uh, this was a bike aimed squarely at uh, professional riders, and you really uh, you weren't even going to get one probably unless you had some kind of connection. Uh, but definitely an iconic motorcycle and one of the most important machines of the early 70s. As in previous years, there was a 360 version of the YZ uh, available as well. Uh, so if the 250 wasn't hairy chested enough for you, uh, you could opt to have your uh, arm sockets pulled out by the 360. For 1975, Yamaha had even bigger things in store with the introduction of the very first monoshock design. Now this is the first year that they made it to production. It was available on the larger MX models and the YZs as well. Now, this, uh, the advantage of the monoshock were a couple of things. The main advantage was travel. Uh, at the time, traditional dual shock arrangements gave you somewhere between three and four inches of travel, and this new monoshock would punch out uh, roughly double that. Uh, it was a huge, huge uh, game changer at the time. Uh, this large uh, gas charge shock laid down was uh, basically sat inside the frame here, as you can see, um, between the where the tank would be. And... Uh, Gave the bike the ability to, you know, smash through rough terrain that the DualShock bike would have been hopping all over creation on. Now, there were some disadvantages. This original monoshock, because of where they put the shock, did tend to fade. It uh, didn't get much air up underneath the uh, tank there. And the layout of the shock also caused some kind of strange handling quirks. Uh, something called Yamaha Hop, which was you know, notorious in the 70s. Um, the bike, when uh, under power, it tracked pretty well. But if you backed off the throttle, uh, they tended to kick and hop sideways. Uh, this ad here, you see, they kind of also talk about uh, a more universal um, uh, flex to the rear swing arm because the uh, there's not one damper, I mean, a one damper instead of two. Um, that may have been the case. Uh, there was issues even with monoshock designs with the flexi uh, swing arm. I think the more problem was the swing arms weren't strong enough back then, but Yamaha made the case that this would be uh, more stable as well. Uh, but there's no discounting the fact that this was a revolution at the time. As I said, it was available here on the... Some of the MX models, not all of them, the 125 didn't get it initially, uh, but the 250 and the uh, 360 did. Uh, and the, I'm sorry, the 400, they upgraded the engine as well to a 400cc motor in, in uh, 1975 here. Big, big, big changes for motocross, and this would basically kick off the suspension revolution. This is the first bike where they really started uh, uh, reaching long travel shocks, and within a couple of years, all the motor, uh, manufacturers would have long travel shocks and forks on their machines, although only Yamaha... I went with the monoshock. When all uh, the other manufacturers decided to do this, they went with a um, laying down the conventional shocks, uh, kind of cantilevering them forward, um, which gave them a long travel as well and gave it a kind of a more progressive action. Uh, but this is a really, really important machine for, uh, for Yamaha and motocross history for sure. After huge changes in 1975, uh, Yamaha was back with another year of major changes in 1976. Uh, now, one thing I do want to mention in this ad for the new YZ125 is this guy, Bruce McDougall. Uh, when I was doing the research for this, I came across this ad. I have no idea who Bruce McDougall is. Uh, I guess he was a big deal at some point. Looks like he switched from Honda to Yamaha for 1976. But, of course, um, I was five when this happened, so definitely not on my radar. But um, this YZ was definitely a pretty cool machine in 1976. Uh, the major difference on the 125 was the addition of air forks. Now... Uh, a lot of people, you know, Air Forks now, still very controversial. I think uh, KTM is the only company still using them. Uh, but they they were actually first introduced here in 1976 by Yamaha on the production side. These were genuine A4 Air Forks, pneumatic forks. They didn't have springs. Uh, very similar to the technology, at least in theory, to what you would have seen in the early uh, 2010s here on all the Japanese manufacturers. Um, I don't know at the time if they went to it for the same reasons, to save money and save weight, but uh, if you figure that air suspension was uh, a pretty big deal with the Fox shocks and stuff in the 70s, it kind of makes sense that they would try the same idea with the forks, and Yamaha did that with their uh, YZ motocrossers in 
1976. Now, another interesting thing they did was they um, kind of folded the 250 and 360 YZs into a new combined MX YZ. Uh, there was no MX uh, 250 or 360 or 400 for 1976, uh, and there was no super high cost works replica YZ. Uh, the YZs had been, you know, great performance wise, but they were very expensive. Um, and they were definitely, the performance was geared more towards pros. They were kind of uh, difficult to ride and a handful if you weren't, you know, a real fast guy. So for 1976, Yamaha consolidated those models, kind of toned down uh, the YZ and uh, folded that into one, one bike, the new YZ250 and YZ400. It was much less expensive, but of course it didn't have all the exotic lightweight materials. It wasn't as light as the 75 um, and lacked a little bit of that uh, kind of exotica the old model had. Uh, but going forward, this would be uh, what people would have as the premier Yamaha motocross model. There was no longer a quote-unquote works replica in the line. Now, for 1976, um, there was still an MX-125, and as you can see here, it had long travel shocks, but uh, it does not have the monoshock. What they did was they laid the uh, shocks down like the competition was doing, like Suzuki was doing with theirs, uh, to give it the longer travel uh, but it didn't get the monoshock in 1976. If you wanted to go with uh, monoshock, you had to step up to a YZ uh, if you wanted the, all that uh, trick rear suspension. For 1977, Yamaha had a bunch more uh, new innovations and changes on tap. The forks that were so awesome in uh, 1976 were gone. Uh, after only one year, Yamaha ditched the pneumatic forks. Um, they apparently work pretty well. I never got to ride with a set, but uh, when I'm doing the research here, most of the magazines like them, but they're kind of finicky to set up. Kind of the same issues people had with them in uh, the modern era. Uh, they had the same problems in 1976. But for 1977, they switched back to a set of conventional uh, air and spring forks. Now, the air in this uh, case was used to as a kind of an assist to the regular springs. In the old days, they would use uh, air pressure to fine-tune the ride a little bit, almost like uh, giving it a little extra spring tension. Uh, but, of course, there are downsides to that. The air, as it gets warm, uh, expands and changes the pressure. But this was a common uh, common thing in the 70s. The new forks had a leading axle to them. What that did was it kind of changed the geometry a little bit to uh, make the bike handle better. This was a trick that Husqvarna and Mako had had uh, on their motocross bikes for several years. And it was one of the keys to the bike's uh, handling so well. So Yamaha went to a leading axle fork for 1977. Uh, they also increased the travel. Uh, there was a new shock. This new shock was a decarbon type and that takes its name from the uh, doctor who uh, holds the patents, invented the original uh, gas nitrogen oil shock and uh, Yamaha went to him and actually licensed this patent for 1977 and put a legitimate decarbon shock on these uh, 77YZs. Uh, the nice thing about this shock was it was much easier to tune than the previous versions. Uh, there was actually an external compression adjustment you can see here on the upper left. Uh, it was a little screw up underneath the tank there, and you could adjust it for preload. Uh, previous models, you could make some adjustments, but you had to disassemble the whole motorcycle to get to it. So the 77 made it a lot easier. Uh, this is the first year for the plastic tank on the YZs. Uh, this made it a lot more durable, but of course uh, decals uh, didn't stick too well to the plastic, especially in the early days. It was uh, They weren't long for this world on the side. All three of the full-size YZs got the benefits of these upgrades. The decarbon shock, the new forks uh, with the leading axle, um, new tank, like I said, plastic tank. Uh, pretty much a redesign all around. It's pretty amazing how much they changed these bikes from year to year back in the 70s. Uh, even the YZ80 got a pretty substantial up, update in 1977 with some additional suspension and motor upgrades. For 1978, Yamaha was very proud of all the number one plates they earned in 77, and they proclaimed them here at this uh, first page of the ad for the new YZs. This is something you'd see Yamaha do quite uh, quite extensively going forward after they uh, won all the titles here in 1978. They ended up putting big number ones on all their motorcycles for about five or six years. Uh, as a kid, I thought that was cool, but I know it was a pain to get that number one off if you weren't going to uh, ride around like you uh, were Bob Hanna and actually want to put your own numbers on. Now for 78, uh, the YZs again were pretty majorly redesigned. It's kind of a remarkable, like I said, how much they change them from year to year. Uh, all the full-size YZs in uh, 1978 get all new frames that are uh, crafted out of chromoly steel, which is a much stronger steel uh, than what they, the uh, YZs had been uh, using for the last few years before this. Um, it was kind of like the 
analog to what you'd see on a KTM now versus what you'd see on an XR or something. Uh, the milder steel just wasn't as uh, durable and uh, capable of fighting chassis flex and uh, keeping from getting cracks and what have you. So the only frame was there. Uh, once again, they upgraded the suspension. There was more travel for 1978. Uh, the chassis was new um, on all the bikes to accommodate the, uh, the new frame material and also the new suspension. Uh, the typical motor redesigns and stuff. Uh, visually, these bikes don't look a whole lot different than 77, aside from the addition of a new aluminum swing arm. Uh, I do think that that makes a huge difference in the appearance. Um, for 78, this is the first year for the big alloy triangulated swing arm, and that made a big difference in terms of uh, chassis flex when you compared that with or paired that with the chromoly steel uh, frame. Uh, these early bikes, you know, especially when they started getting long travel suspension, flex became a pretty big issue because just like, um, you know, you, you lengthen a lever, it has more leverage, I could pardon it, um, on the uh, on the chassis, and it was uh, tended to have a little more problem keeping the bike from twisting under all that force. Uh, so it became much more of an issue to try and find a way to stiffen things up to prevent it from uh, flexing under high load high loads, you know, long big jumps and what have you. Uh, for 1978, the YZ80 gets a monoshock as well, a decarbon de de uh, damper, although it does not get the chromoly frame or the uh, alloy swing arm. For 1979, Yamaha was back once again with a lot of uh, stuff to brag about. The ad here features Brock Glover, Bob Hanna, and Rick Burgett. All three were national title winners in 1978 for the Yamaha team. Like I said, this is the inspiration for those big number ones you'd see on the, the plates moving forward here after a year or two. Um, like I said, they kicked butt that year. For 1978, these YZs don't look a lot different. The main visual difference is the new FIM mandated uh, side panels. You can see the number plate has moved back farther, and that was to aid scoring. Um, I think this makes a huge difference in the appearance. I, I really like this look. I never did care for the little stubby side plates. Um, maybe people who are younger, army older than me, might have cared for that design. But to me, this always looked better. I do uh, really, really think this helps the looks overall. Uh, the bikes, like I said, don't look a lot different other than that, but they're pretty substantially changed. Um, they made some, uh, all the major uh, full-size bikes had uh, chassis changes, new shocks. The shocks were uh, crafted out of aluminum instead of steel to save weight and also, um, you know, help with cooling. Uh, there was new uh, tidbits all over the bike to save weight and improve handling. The chassis had a little different geometry for 79 day turning. These YZs were not known for the best turning, the monoshocks originally. The, um, the shock itself being up so high in the chassis gave the bikes kind of a, a top-heavy feel. And uh, the front suspension, a lot of people didn't really care for it, the way it stuck in the turns. Uh, like I said, the, the handling, on the one hand, was aided at first by the monoshock. But as the other bikes kind of got the long travel thing sorted out, I think the Yamaha's kind of fell a little behind in terms of handling. But uh, this 79 is a good-looking motorcycle. They're pretty good bikes overall. Like I said, no, no motorcycle was perfect in the 70s. But uh, this was a good year for Yamaha, to be sure. Okay, so there we have it. A look back at the 1970s Yamaha YZ models. Uh, through their ads and brochures. Um, I hope you enjoyed this uh, look back. If you did, let me know in the comments below or on social media, and I'll do one for the 80s, 90s, and maybe 2000s as well. Um, I've been collecting all the ads. takes me quite a while, but uh, again, I hope you all enjoy this. Um, I post stuff like this all the time on social media, so if you like to uh, look at some classic motocross stuff, make sure you follow me on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, my handle there is at Tony Blazer. That's at T-O-N-Y B-L-A-Z-I-E-R. I also uh, write for Pulp MX, and you can see all my writing at PulpMX.com. I uh, do classic uh, motocross reviews, uh, stuff similar to this. Uh, sometimes people like to read it, so uh, please give it, a give it a try if you'd like to uh, check out some classic moto stuff on the web. Uh, until we meet again, this has been Tony Blazer, and uh, keep the rubber side down.